In this video, I'm going to talk about JavaScript journalism, the skill of using interactivity to tell stories, which often involves using code and specifically JavaScript. I'm going to talk about some of the different formats that you might create using JavaScript um, and how those relate to interactivity. I'm going to talk about some libraries as well and, and what libraries do in JavaScript and, and I'll name a few in particular that might be worth exploring. And I'll talk about how to get started with this. Generally, in this presentation, I'm going to focus on editorial ideas and some of the basic principles that you need to know in order to get involved with JavaScript and interactive storytelling. And to do that, I want to begin with the principle of variability. This is a, a principle which Lev Manovich discusses in his book, The Language of New Media, from 2011. Um, and it's to do with the idea that with modern digital storytelling, the, um, the, the data that we're working with, the raw materials of our story, is something which is variable. Uh, in other words, it can exist in many different versions. We can tell our stories about one data set in many different ways. And this is one of the reasons why the potential for interactivity is introduced, and also not just one form of interactivity, but indeed many different forms of interactivity. The data, uh, the content of a story is separate from its presentation. This is a distinction that's embodied in the way that HTML is separate from CSS, but also in the way that JavaScript is separate from HTML. So JavaScript is often about the behavior of a story, whereas HTML is the pure content. Now, I said there are a number of formats involved in interactivity. Um, here are just some, and it's worth listing them here in terms of helping you generate ideas around interactivity and potential opportunities for you to develop skills with JavaScript and other code. So, you might, for example, want to create a quiz. Now, you can create quizzes with third-party tools online, but you can also create them yourself using JavaScript. You might want to create a choose-your-own-adventure um, game or, or story where the user can um, have a different direction through the story depending on choices that they make. Uh, again, this is something you can create with third-party tools like Twine, but again, you can also hard-code it using JavaScript or other libraries. You can create bots, you can create games. Counters are a format that you might want to embed in a story to create a little bit of interactivity or countdowns. You might want to make tables in a story sortable or searchable. You might want to make charts, graphs and maps which are more powerful or you have more control over them than if you were to uh, use online tools to create them. In other words, by using JavaScript you can create more interactivity or more specific elements of interactivity than would otherwise be possible. Or you might want to use JavaScript to make images or video interactive or to create interactive sliders. These are all examples of formats of interactivity which have become generic and indeed many of them have dedicated libraries that solve the problems involved, which we'll come on to. The key with all of these formats is that no one knows how to create every one of those types of interactive stories. Um, what we do know is how to break down the processes, how to approach that technical challenge. And this is where computational thinking comes in particularly handy. What we need to do with any of these projects, any of these types of stories, is break down the project, first of all, into the separate challenges that are involved. And I'll go through some examples of this in a minute. Once we've done that, we can find the code that addresses each of those challenges. In other words, the specific functions or indeed the broader libraries of functions that might have been created to specifically address those challenges. And then finally, we adapt the code that we find to our specific problem our specific project. So it's not a case of writing the code from scratch, it's often a case of looking around to find code that does the job that we need. So let's take um, some of those formats that I mentioned, quizzes, choose your own adventure stories, bots and games. All of these actually break down into quite similar challenges. In each of these formats, the 
primary challenge is to be able to load a new element on the page when someone clicks a button. In other words, in a quiz, someone might click on an answer and we need to be able to load um, a result. In other words, whether they were right or wrong, or we might be able to tell them what the correct answer is. That involves adding new elements to the page. In a choose your own adventure story, it's a similar process. The user makes a choice and then new elements are loaded to tell them what happens next in the story based on their choice. Likewise with bots, they're asked to make a choice and are su supplied with information in response or indeed games, which are probably the most complex uh, example of this process. There are many different clicks and, and new elements um, that take place in a more complex game. But fundamentally, all these formats come down to that key technical challenge. How do I load a new element onto the page when the user clicks a button? And the technical answer to that, the solution to that is um, you need to create some sort of click event in JavaScript. In basic JavaScript, the, the specific function is actually called onClick. Um, and that can be triggered by a particular uh, and particular element being cl clicked and that will then trigger other actions on the page which you can then move on to how do I make this appear and so on but fundamentally that's what we're talking about understanding the existence of click events or click triggered events uh, now that's in basic JavaScript but in some JavaScript libraries in other words collections of functions that you can add to your page um, there are quite similar functions, equivalents in those libraries as well. So in jQuery, for example, uh, and D3, there is a function called click or a function called on, which is then supplied with the parameter click, which do very similar things. They trigger events based on a click. All of this is basically just to say that the solution to that problem, that challenge of loading new page elements, is normally some sort of click event and that click event will trigger a function, a further function that targets elements on the page and alters them. So for example, you might have a div tag on your page, which has got nothing in it, but when someone clicks on that, uh, clicks on something on the page, then the div tag is targeted and some extra information, some extra text is added, such as correct or wrong. It might be a more complex event that happens or a more complex um, change to the page. In that case, it might target the whole of the body tag um, and add a whole bunch of HTML when someone clicks on a particular button in the quiz or the bot or the game. But that's an, an example of breaking that down. Now, in the uh, GitHub repo, you'll find uh, a brief introduction to triggering actions with a click using basic JavaScript, um, in this case to create a, a quiz is the example that's used. So you can follow this to get some idea of that particular process. Let's look at a couple more formats then, counters and countdowns. If we broke those down in terms of a challenge, um, really the key technical challenge is we need to calculate a number, such as an amount per second or the amount of seconds left until a particular event. We need to then show that number on the page um, in some sort of page element, for example, a paragraph tag or a span tag. We then need to wait for a period of time a second for example and then change that number that's essentially how a counter works it starts with one number then after a period of time it goes up and up and up with a countdown it starts at a particular number and counts down and again on the github repo you'll find a um, description of how to create a counter in javascript with some example code on code pen so you can explore that process further and uh, adapt this particular example on code pen for a countdown as well. Thirdly and finally then let's look at um, tables and how we would create interactive or live tables. The technical challenge here is that we need to have some HTML for, an, for a table which is empty, so an empty table that can be targeted. We need to then load some data into that empty table so it's not empty anymore, it's live and um, we need to then 
essentially loop through that data and create a row for each item or uh, insert that into the table cell. We might also want to add some features where if they click on the top of the table it creates some interaction as well. And again in the re repo you'll find um, an example of how to use a JavaScript library which is designed for this particular challenge. It's called Sortable, very simple and straightforward. It requires very little coding um, and it will turn a standard HTML table into one that allows the user to sort it. You can also find other JavaScript libraries devoted to the challenges around tables and interactive tables. Um, table saw is one in particular and again you'll find a link here to um, a number of code pens where people have uh, used that library in different ways which you can adapt for your library if you want to create some sort of interactivity. Now we've mentioned a few libraries along the way and I want to just take a moment to, to focus on libraries and some which are particularly useful. Again to explain what a library is, it's a collection of functions for a series of tasks or challenges that tend to be related. So for example the leaflet library in JavaScript is a collection of functions around mapping, so all around different challenges and tasks related to creating a map. The D3 library has a lot of uh, functions related to visualization and charts. It's an enormous uh, library, D3, very powerful, very flexible. As a result, probably more difficult than other um, libraries. For example, Sortable, which we've mentioned already, is a very simple library, very easy to get to grips with because it only really does some uh, a few things. Tabletop is another library for dealing with tables mentioned there and we have mentioned table sort already so you'll often find a number of different libraries which solve the same or similar problems. jQuery is another very powerful library in JavaScript which um, has a number of functions particularly around interactivity on the page and creating different effects and behaviors on a HTML web page like slides and fades and basically click triggered activity. PDF.js is a library for dealing with PDFs. Slides is a library for creating interactive slideshows. Um, Keylines is um, a library for doing social network diagrams, network analysis. And Time Map will create a map and a timeline side by side. And these are just a few examples of the many dozens or hundreds of libraries just in JavaScript alone. What I want to do here is partly draw your attention to some but also the, the types of tasks that these libraries might relate to and the fact that a key stage in any project is to start the search um, for libraries which might be useful for your particular task and you might try a few out and find the one which a suits your particular problem in your project and b that you can actually get to grips with so it might be that you pick a simpler library over a more complex one or a library which has better documentation and better tutorials that make more sense rather than a library where the documentation or the tutorials aren't as clear as you would like. At this point it's also worth highlighting that any sort of project, particularly those involving uh, interactivity or coding, often involve quite an emotional journey. After the initial rush of, of a great idea you will probably come across a point where you start to despair and think that um, actually this is going to be a lot more work than I realised, uh, I have no idea what I'm doing and this really is rubbish. Um, be prepared to go through those stages but also um, realise that they are generally temporary. You will come out the other side and, and that experience is a really important experience because the more that you go through that the, the easier it will become to persist and, and, and believe that you are going to come through the other side with something good uh, and you will be, be better at coding, you will have learned something from it even if it's not. So just some key points to wrap up then. First of all Consider interactive formats and elements in your data journalism. Um, you might consider them because they strengthen the story and create an engaging user experience. You might consider them simply because you want to explore JavaScript and build those skills. Both of those reasons are perfectly valid. 
but start to think about that in your storytelling. Secondly, as you consider those, break down the technical challenges that that interactivity represents, the technical challenges that you will need to take on. Try not to take on a project which has too many of those. Keep it simple to begin with, master some of those, and then add to the skills that you have with further challenges and more complex projects. And finally, explore the libraries that are out there related to the challenge that you're taking on and the particular type of project that you're working on. Find tutorials and documentation related to those libraries so you can get to grips with how they work and then adapt that code to your own challenge and your own project. Remember in coding and programming and interactivity, you're pretty much always standing on the shoulders of giants. You're building on work that's come before you. You're very rarely writing code from scratch. Um, and that's part of the skill is being able to find the code that already exists, libraries and so on, and to be able to adapt that to your purposes.